Well, hey, was Amos, and uh, thank you very much, everybody. Good evening here in the States. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity um, for a really robust dialogue here uh, with KO and uh, Columbia University uh, Cyber Dialogue. Um, so uh, I'll get right to it because the speakers are really the center of attention here. And with us this evening for the March dialogue, we have two distinguished speakers. So the first speaker tonight will be uh, Mr. Akira Saka. So he's the CISO of the Digital Agency and the Government of Japan. I think as many of you know, uh, Mr. Saka has a tremendous amount of experience in the cyber and uh, national security uh, realm. Uh, he was also the Chief Information Security Officer for the Tokyo Organizing Committee for the Olympics. Uh, in addition to that, throughout the government of Japan, he served in a number of capacities, National Police Agency, as well as the Ministry of Land of Infrastructure and Transportation. Uh, a second guest speaker this evening, uh, Mark Montgomery, uh, he serves as a Senior Advisor to the Chairman of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, where he was the Executive Director, and he's also the Director of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation. Um, I think as a senior fellow also, he's uh, the foundation uh, the foundation of defense of democracies. I think it really significant, he was the policy director for Senate Armed Services Committee under the leadership of Senator John McCain. So I think what we'll do is we'll get to them, have their uh, um, presentations, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So without further any uh, delay, like to turn it over to Saka-san. So, thank you very much. Well, Paul, and before you start, Saka-san, something I had told everybody I would do, which I'll do belatedly now, is just to remind the group that we're going to be on, when we are on recording now, and we'll, you know, as we've done previously, those recordings will be available, you know, uh, after the event. But then when the speakers have finished their remarks, we'll be moving to Chatham House Rules and, and not recording. So, just wanted to remind everybody of that. So, sorry for the interruption. Uh, uh, yep. uh, thank you, Paula and Greg. Uh, uh, so uh, I'd like to start my presentation. Will you show my screen? Looks good, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, it is my great honor to have this chance to talk about cybersecurity at Tokyo 2020 uh, Olympic and Paralympic Games and its legacy uh, for uh, a digital agents, a digital society in Japan. So uh, uh, I'm also uh, very happy uh, uh, this morning uh, because I'm now with my friends remotely here uh, and thank you very much for uh, uh, this precious opportunity. So uh, the uh, I am Akira Saka, uh, as I uh, introduced, uh, uh, CISO of Digital Agency Japan. I also have the title of CISO of Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Organizing Committee because the organizing committee still exists and uh, works for its legacy, even the games themselves ended. So, uh, so this is the overview of Tokyo 2020. Uh, uh, all of the games uh, were held in 2021. We call it Tokyo 2020 as initially planned. The Olympic Games was held from uh, July 23rd to August 8th, and the Paralympic Games was held from August 24th to uh, September uh, 5th. Uh, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, Tokyo 2020 was the first postponed game in modern Olympic history. In 2019, we expected uh, that Tokyo 2020 would be the largest Olympic and Paralympic Games in history, but they were not because of the pandemic. Uh, but the International Olympic Committee reported last December that uh, a total of 3.05 billion unique viewers turned in to coverage across linear TV and digital platform. And to Tokyo 2020's designation as the first streaming games and the most watched Olympic games ever on digital platforms. Drawing on new technologies and digital innovations, more sports fans interested with the games, making Tokyo 20 a uh, the most engaged Olympic Games ever. 
So this uh, uh, meant uh, that we had to protect these digital platforms. We also utilized advanced IT systems in various and many aspects of games and logistics. So uh, uh, we should protect those systems and uh, combined and complex operations. So uh, Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games ended on September 5th, 2021. Uh, NISC, uh, the National Center of Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity, reported to the Japan Cybersecurity Strategic Headquarters on September 27, 2021, that we did not confirm any cyber attack that impacted the uh, operation in the Tokyo 2020 Games. There were some incidents, including posting a call for uh, cyber attacks on SNS and setting up malicious streaming sites for harvesting credentials and spreading malware. But we completed the games and the competitions as planned for the Tokyo 2020 games. So uh, significant, uh, a significant event such as the Olympic and Paralympic game is likely to be a target of attackers, including criminals, activists, and state-sponsored enactors. And almost all types of attacks might come. Our first priority was to prevent cyber attacks affect, affecting games and operation. About cyber crimes with financial motivation, the ransomware attack uh, has been widespread and rampant during the one year postponement. We must uh, prepare uh, for those highly sophisticated attacks because they target the organizations in charge of critical operations, including the Olympics, oil or food supply, and medical services. We should also prevent cyber attacks affecting games and operations, such as destroying games systems and attacks and against critical infrastructures. In Pyeongchang 2018 Winter Olympic Games, the Olympic destroyer wiper malware destroyed the game's systems at the timing of the opening ceremony. In Tokyo, the International Olympic Committee had a deep concern about cybersecurity because of this real threat. So uh, uh, this is uh, the indictment uh, uh, published by United Department of Justice uh, on October 19th, 2020. They charged the GRU officers for seven causes, which uh, include, uh, so uh, you can see uh, the uh, 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 Olympic related causes uh, on four and five. And the, uh, the uh, spear phishing campaigns and the mobile applications targeted various victims, such as Olympic partners, Introduced into computers supporting the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games culminated in the destructive malware attack against the opening ceremony using malware known as Olympic Destroyer. Uh, so uh, the UK government exposed a series of cyber attacks against the Olympic and the Paralympic Games including Tokyo 2020, on the same day with the United States Department of Justice indictment on September 19, 2020. They said the activities against Tokyo 2020 were cyber reconnaissance, not actual attacks, but the games organizers, logistics services, and partners are included as targets. So uh, uh, we had to protect not only the organizing committee itself, but also our partners and stakeholders. And uh, uh, we are thankful uh, because this kinds of public attribution might deter uh, the attempt of attackers. So this is uh, the uh, uh, example of actual attack to Tokyo 2020. The uh, uh, this was the uh, uh, password uh, spray attack. Around the opening ceremony, there was a huge volume of failed attempts from abroad to log in to Tokyo 2020 system. We assume those were uh, password spray attacks. 
so uh, uh, you can see uh, that the uh, opening ceremony may, uh, might be uh, the target of attackers. So uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, stakeholders of Tokyo 2020. At the bottom, uh, the Tokyo 2020 Organizing Committee and uh, IOC, the International Olympic Committee. So next, uh, the partners, suppliers, contractors, and the local and national governments uh, played vital roles in supporting the games. Critical infrastructures such as transportation, airport, lifeline, etc., were also essential. We had to integrate all actors' effort to secure uh, the games. We owed our security much to those various stakeholders and their corporations. So uh, at the uh, uh, right upper corner, uh, uh, I uh, he mentioned some of the corporations uh, we owed. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, the uh, uh, structure for governmental security policy decision making. Uh, uh, for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games, the Japanese government had established a structure for managing Tokyo 2020 with the cooperation of all governmental agencies of Japan. At the top, uh, uh, there was the headquarters for the Tokyo 2020 Olympic and Paralympic Games, chaired by the prime minister with members of all ministers. Under that headquarters, security board meeting was established. Inside the security board meeting, the uh, cybersecurity working team was set up, chaired by our council of uh, cabinet secretariat in charge of ANIS, National Center of Incident Readiness and Strategy for Cybersecurity. The Japanese government established uh, the whole government approach for the security related to Tokyo 2020. The Japanese government also uh, established the Security Coordination Center and the Cabinet Secretariat to coordinate activities and promote information sharing among government, public agencies, and other stakeholders. This center was not only for cybersecurity, but also for whole security, including physical security. They also established the Security Intelligence Center in National Police Agency and the Cyber Security Incident Response Coordination Center and the Cabinet Secretariat, NISC. So uh, in order to prevent uh, and reduce uh, the impact of cyber attacks on preparation and the uh, running of the Tokyo 2020 games, NISC promoted measures against possible cybersecurity risks by strengthening risk management by peripheral essential service providers, ESPs, that support the games. The ESPs are uh, like this, the uh, 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 critical infrastructure or uh, the venues, including uh, Olympic villages. So uh, uh, this repeatedly uh, risk, uh, as, uh, done a uh, risk assessment for these uh, 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 ESPs and uh, uh, checks the outcome of those uh, risk assessment and uh, uh, promote the uh, 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 remediations for those entities. So uh, the, uh, this is uh, the uh, explanation about the Cybersecurity Incident Response Coordination Center. The main functions of Cybersecurity Incident Response Coordination Center are information sharing, and the coordination for support to incident response with various stakeholders, including an important service suppliers and cyber threat information providers. So this is the explanation of the GISP, uh, Japan Cybersecurity Information Sharing Platform. So uh, there are main uh, uh, three main functions of, of uh, uh, GISP the functions for uh, receiving certain information from information security experts and sharing that with stakeholders for improving their security postures. 
and function for communication ex exercise. Uh, the function for conducting exercise to ensure smooth reporting in case of incident occurrence and indicator and threat information sharing function. So uh, uh, this is a scheme of the GSP, uh, but uh, just for your eyes. Then the, uh, uh, so uh, uh, this the uh, uh, organization is sharing info uh, 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 with uh, Tokyo 2020. Uh, uh, besides information sharing through GISP, IOC has newly established an intelligence sharing platform among Olympic partners and international stakeholders. And this chart showed uh, the whole design of the Tokyo 2020 cybersecurity enforcement plan. First, we strengthened systems by hardening our information systems and network and implementing security policies and architecture to venues, systems, and networks in each step of design, construction, and operation. Uh, second, we enhanced the security of the organizations and individuals by a robust ID password protection, training, and exercises. Third, we gathered information from various sources and we monitored our assets, analyzed the data, and detected anomalies to respond based on that information. Fourth, the Tokyo 2020 security team supported the decision makers to properly deal with incidents by assessing the impact on games and operations, physical safety, and security. So uh, uh, this is the overview of preparation, games time, and uh, outcome uh, uh, operations. Before the games, uh, 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 we, we revised our countermeasures after the performance uh, uh, according to the uh, climate change of cyber uh, security posture. And uh, in the game's time, uh, we uh, did the 24-hour operation at the Technology Operation Center, including SAP Security Operation Center. The uh, government liaison stayed during the game's time, and uh, cooperation of stakeholders, including global partners, uh, uh, was very uh, uh, effective. And sharing information and sense of emergence uh, for actions uh, is also critical. So uh, the outcome, the no, no cyber attacks that would influence the uh, management of the games were uh, uh, confirmed. So, uh, 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 so uh, we are now implementing uh, 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 the uh, legacy of uh, uh, experiences uh, through uh, this operation of Tokyo 2020. So, uh, so for, first, I'd like to introduce the digital agency. The digital agency started on September 1st, 2021. So, so uh, 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 actually, uh, the Tokyo, to, uh, Tokyo 2020 was ended in September 2021, and the digital agency started on September. So uh, the basic idea of digital agency is that, uh, that is at the headquarters with a strong noble inter-ministerial uh, coordination function. And also, it strongly promotes digital transformation policies in an integrated and streamlined manner, which has been previously conducted separately by each ministry. And uh, uh, in, uh, including missions and duties, cybersecurity implementation. And uh, uh, so, this is uh, the cybersecurity implementation framework in Japan. So, uh, uh, you can see uh, the uh, digital agency uh, right up a corner, and uh, the digital agency uh, closely working together with uh, NISC and other ministries to uh, uh, make up uh, the cyber strategy in Japan. And uh, on 27th of September 2021, the new cybersecurity uh, uh, strategy uh, of Japan uh, issued. So this is the outline of the cybersecurity strategy of 2021. And uh, uh, 
So uh, my policy is a digital, trans uh, digital transformation with cybersecurity. And also, the, uh, uh, this is issued under a direction of Japan cybersecurity strategy 20, 2021. The, uh, uh, this includes uh, the uh, Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games experiences and, uh, uh, and, you, and, and they mentioned that the utilizing public and private initiative for uh, cybersecurity for all. So uh, I, I'm sorry, this is a little bit this, uh, big uh, slide, but uh, this is the uh, content of uh, our uh, cybersecurity strategy. Uh, uh, this is the uh, whole picture, but I'd like to uh, show you the exact uh, relating to uh, the Tokyo 2020 the legacy. So uh, first, uh, the, uh, 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 for uh, providing a cybersecurity uh, and by all, oh, oh, sorry, this is the uh, uh, spelled. Uh, 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 oh. Oops, sorry. Sorry, so uh, uh, the uh, environment of which protects the people and the society. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, for deploy comprehensive cyber defense, uh, the uh, enhance uh, the functions of the national CERT and CSERT which handles general coordination of integrated advancement from response to cyber attacks to policy measures, including prevention of recurrence. So uh, uh, also, uh, so uh, uh, we are now on the way to enhance the function of national CERT and CSAT, uh, 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 utilizing the experience of Tokyo 2020. And also uh, this is the, uh, uh, specific measures for seamless information sharing and collaboration by multiple stakeholders and the enhancement of readiness to respond to massive cyber attacks. So uh, actively use uh, findings and know-how obtained through response capabilities and operation at the Tokyo Games to support business operators and etc. So we are now on the way to uh, utilize uh, uh, this uh, 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 ex experience and uh, actually we uh, have got uh, one team through the experience of Tokyo 2020 operations. So uh, we are now uh, working together uh, to uh, uh, upgrade our cybersecurity level uh, uh, you know, following the uh, uh, Tokyo 20 uh, legacy. And thank you very much for my presentation, hearing my presentation. Well, that's great, Sakasan. Thank you very much for your comprehensive presentation. And um, I think what we'll do is we'll go right into Mark's presentation. And if anyone has any questions, you can start to populate that in the chat, and then Eli will start to compile some of that. So we'll move through to the next uh, presentation. So, uh, Mark, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, and I appreciate um, uh, the opportunity to, to speak today. And um, I apologize to one or two of the Americans who I recognize in the group who have heard me talk a little bit about this before, but um, what I'll try to do is summarize what changes, uh, what, what changes we have been going through in our, um, in our cybersecurity environment, particularly in terms of the federal government and what changes we hope to see happen over the next 12 months. Um, I'll back up by saying I came from the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. That was probably the first, my first exposure to the um, significant issues, at least in the last 20 years of federal cybersecurity. And, and I was working for Senator John McCain, but he wasn't alone. There were a number of senators and congressmen who really felt that deterrence was no longer working throughout all of cyberspace. What that meant was, is that while we were deterring, um, you know, either Russian or some other nation state attacking our power grid, you know, openly or wantonly, you know, that, that was deterred by the idea that we had significant capabilities to do something back. A lot of behavior was happening below the threshold at which we would respond to action. And, and uh, a couple of things really stuck in Senator McCain's crawl. One was the OPM 
data theft because he thought his records were in the 24 million that were taken. Another was the really, what he considered a poor response to the um, Sony, uh, the DPRK attack on Sony. And, um, and then, and the lack of tools that were available to the administration to handle it. And certainly the idea of indicting North Korean military officers, he found humorous because he was pretty sure they weren't gonna get extradited. And he was equally sure they might get a medal upon notification of their indictments. Um, and then uh, he was worried about the intellectual property theft, uh, recognizing it wasn't all cyber, but you know, that was reported in Admiral Blair's um, intellectual property uh, theft commission. And then he was, you know, I think the thing that motivated him temporarily at the moment that, that we passed, uh, set up the commission was the cyber enabled information operations against our 2016 election. Um, so based on that, he had us take a look at, you know, how can you restore deterrence or how can you prevent significant attacks against your critical infrastructure and your democratic institutions. And uh, you know, after studying this for some time, interviewing many of the people, uh, uh, at least on the American side, on this uh, on this um, uh, Zoom, uh, we came up with you know the idea that you you probably needed to really do three three things well. The first was we actually had to learn how to defend our critical infrastructure, how to make the investments that are possible. We had become a little lazy in the sense of this. We had this beautiful. Um, separation of you know, the Atlantic and the Pacific uh, from most traditional threats, good neighbors in Canada and Mexico, and um, cyber completely obviously removed that geographic advantage. And, uh, and this came at a moment when we had become highly integrated. In other words, our risk, our, our, uh, our risk to, um, and, to vulner and our vulnerabilities were increasing exponentially because the, the uh, integration and networking of our uh, society and economy um, and uh, that, that came true just at the same time that cyber tools were becoming more available and useful to different types of cyber malicious act actors. So two exponentially increasing risks. And you know, we were moving along, plotting along with kind of a linear cyber mitigation effort in terms of investments in cyber security. So we really do have to defend our, uh, our, um, our infrastructure and I think a final thing that really got us was that we automated a lot of our infrastructure. You think about pipelines, water systems, electrical power grids. And you know, when I was a young kid, you know, pipeline would be operated by you know, several dozen men every hundred miles as linesmen walking around, opening valves, shutting valves, starting pumps. That all become automated when there's absolutely no appreciable understanding of a cybersecurity risk. So you're introducing an um, an ICS system or SCADA system that was driving IT and OT devices um, with, with no presumption of a need to build in security. And so we automated it at a time when it, it, uh, it, that introduced quite a bit of risk. So we actually have to defend our products. And, and obviously not everyone is undefended. There are a series of banks in our country that spend 750 million a piece or more on uh, on cybersecurity and, you know, have, I like to say they have op centers that make a four-star blush, you know, a, a military leader blush. Um, but uh, the, uh, um, you know, that's the anomaly. The vast majority, a large part of our infrastructure, particularly the part that's owned and operated by state and local utilities who are inherently not wealthy. Um, cybersecurity has been an area of risk acceptance for a long period of time. So we actually have to defend ourselves. That, and you know, we now know, we understand that 80, 85% of the US national critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector or the state and local governments. That's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Um, the second leg of the stool that we needed to get right was our public-private collaboration. That's the government's role and supporting this. And I mentioned I'd been gone for 20 years, but 23 years ago, I helped write a national infrastructure assurance plan. And if you read what we laid out there 23 years ago and what we got done, I'd say at best, we got about 30, almost all of it was about building a public-private collaboration. Or well, at the time we called it a public-private partnership, but it was a, we've gotten about 30% done. And even for the federal government, 30, 30 is a poor grade uh, over 23 years. 
Um, and then finally, the third thing that we thought had to get fixed or had to be addressed was make sure you have sufficient offensive cyber um, uh, operators. In other words, that you're able to impose cost if you choose to impose cost, either using military or intelligence capabilities. Uh, the good news there is I think that leg of the stool was strong to begin with, and there's been some legislation passed to make it stronger. It certainly can still use work, but the um, it started out probably the best position of the three legs. So coming forward, what where the big changes were, I think one area where the United States has made big improvements, and I should caveat this with, when the government makes a change, if it's legislative, you won't see really the effects of change for anywhere from eight, to, uh, a year and a half to three years, so sometimes a little bit longer. If the executive branch makes the change, I think you can see the difference in six months to a year to maybe two years. But in either case, it takes a long time to make change. So we recommended 82 changes, 50 through laws and 30 through executive branch actions. About half of those, or a little more than half of those, are being implemented now but very few of them are actually functional. Um, and that's something important thing to understand that, you know, it, in, particularly in a democracy, change is incremental. It takes a, a period of time. We have started to really reorganize the US government. We've strengthened our cybersecurity infrastructure security agency. We've established a position called national cyber director at the strategic level. And one I think is an interesting one not talked about too often is we have, um, We've codified how federal agencies that are the lead for uh, an infrastructure, we call them sector risk management agencies, how they should work with the private sector, what their responsibilities are for that relationship so that they can be assessed by either the executive branch or by Congress, like, are you doing this job? You know, the reason we had to pass this law is that the answer to that question was a very inconsistent one, some federal agencies were doing a, a good job managing risk or trying to assist their infrastructure sector, but some were doing a very poor job. Some were doing almost no job. And so we tried to codify this into law. Um, I do think one of the areas where uh, you know, we probably got, you know, are, are less than halfway there is improving our resilience, which is obviously important. Um, we have not been able to figure out how to buy down risk by um, identifying weak spots in our infrastructure and fixing them ahead of time with government funding. It's just something that's been difficult to get through the Congress. On the other hand, we have been able to deal with risk by once it happens by establishing what's called a response and recovery fund to allow the government to step in rapidly after the, after the impact of a significant cyber attack. Obviously solving the right of boom, the right of the attack um, issue is important, but it would be even more, uh, more uh, valuable to, to, to uh, solve that left of the attack issue. Um, so, and then finally, we have done poorly again. Our commission did poorly, the Congress has done poorly. I think the executive branch has done poorly in building the meaningful public-private collaboration we need. Uh, we still are, we're not at that point where you can envision the rapid transfer at the speed of data of threat information, threat signatures that the government has to the private sector. The private sector is doing a good job in areas. There's some real areas of excellence in this, transferring and sharing information between themselves. It would be highly advantageous for the government to be in that loop. But for a lot of reasons, we've done poorly. Now, on the good side, one of the major reasons in my mind was classification. And there was no signs of that getting better. Now, very recently, our president declassified a whole lot of information about Russia on the fly. I'm hoping that that kind of like that sense of, if you're going to deal with, a, a, uh, with um, autocracies, you really have to figure out how to, how to rapidly declassify information to get rid of disinformation and get the truth and get validity out there, then we, you know, if that could pass over into how we think about information sharing with the private sector and with state and local governments, that would go a long way. But for now, that's a disappointment. The other is we have not done a good job reorganizing our State Department yet. We, we've passed the appropriate laws in one chamber of our Congress, but not in the other. I'm hoping we can get this closed soon. 
This is important because our State Department and Commerce Departments need to do a much better job leading our, our, na our national representatives, but also our business representatives at various international standard, standard setting organizations. And many of these organizations, our historical role, along with the French and others, if you go back 20 years of kind of guaranteeing standards that were based on transparency and rule of law, our non-performance, non-attendance, inability to influence, at the, at the some standards are standard setting bodies are led by the government, some are led by the private sector, but in both cases, the United States has been um, largely absent and ineffective in setting the standards. So we really need to do that. An organized State Department would help, an organized and properly manned Commerce Department would help. Uh, we have some laws to try to fix this and get it jump started and get some money into the problem. Um, and uh, in the, it happens to be in what's called our China bill that might pass in the next month or two. Um, but for now, that's a that's an area of weakness. And finally, our workforce has been weak. Um, our our uh, development of our federal workforce has been weak. Um, you know, and, and if you look back, we've written reports, three reports over the last 15 years. And every time we've identified the same six or seven solutions, and five years later, the same uh, six or seven problems are still there without being solved. So we really need to attack that. If I could say um, one positive thing um, going forward, and then I'll, I'll wrap up, is that this has been a truly, this, this issue remains a relatively bipartisan issue. By the measure of con our congressional relations and, our, and the politics of the United States, cybersecurity has maintained bipartisan. That doesn't mean there aren't partisan moments, particularly on um, privacy versus security. That, that applies a lot in the encryption area. But also with, um, it's still very parochial. Agencies and, and the committees that support them, the congressional committees that support them, will often block things that are useful for other federal agencies. It, you saw this break out in the open when our Department of Justice and FBI suddenly started complaining about our, recent, our recently passed and signed into law incident reporting bill, where they were not comfortable with the cybersecurity infrastructure security agency taking the lead. And uh, you know, our law enforcement has not come to recognize yet that they are a very important but supporting element of the cybersecurity fight and that the leadership in the United States belongs in our, with our, with CISA, Department of Homeland Security at that, at the, for, for these kind of issues. So um, it, it's a bipartisan issue. It has parochial challenges. And every once in a while, you'll see a little bit of of differences based on, I wouldn't say partisanship, but ideology about how you look at the role of the federal government and things. Um, so, you know, we, we, uh, we are working hard on these issues, but again, all the changes we've made so far, I don't think we'll see the full effect of their implementation for another six to 12 months, maybe 18 months. And there's more changes we have to do this year that again, will take two to three years. So I guess I'll wrap, on, I'll wrap up on our last issue, which says, we just had a very weird experience where our president put out a memo and a senior national security official said we government, you know, industry has to do more, um, you know, about the potential for Russia attack. And I, I think this is, it is reasonable for us to assume something bad is gonna happen. I think as our sanctions continue to bite and maybe we in, increase to have what are called secondary sanctions on financial transfers and Russia really feels the heat, Russia can't respond with economic punishment against us they're going to have to use cyber malicious tools. And, you know, our senior leadership in the White House and the Department of Homeland Security and the National Cyber Director all understand that we live in a glass house and that if the Russians really do make a, an earnest effort, uh, they could damage our infrastructure. And that's why you see these kind of these um, aggressive warnings. Of course, the problem is that for all these warnings, if, if a company hasn't been investing in its cyber resilience for the last um, three to four years, there's not a magic button you can push with a week to go to get ready for a, a attack, an attack by the a Russian advanced persistent threat team. These warnings are really for the companies that have been investing and they have a rheostat between, you know, efficiency and security, and they need to increase the, the you know, the, the application of security measures that make things probably le you know, less accessible, accessible inside their system and potentially less efficient. But um, you, you know, what you hear from the White House is just a general you know, 
everyone get ready call. But the reality is that's still only for those few that are able to get ready. So with that said, um, I'll pass it back to you, Paul, for uh, running a, a Q&A session. But I think I've set up where we kind of sit right now.